I'm Greg Fairchild, and uh, we are here for yet another Leadership Unscripted discussion. Some of you may know me. I'm a professor at the University of Virginia, and I spend my time talking with, thinking about ways that we do two things. First, the way we grow the Darden School's reputation, connections, networks, um, particularly as they relate to the DC region. And then secondly, I'm one who spends time thinking about how we do the best educating we can, particularly in the areas of business strategy, ethics, and entrepreneurship. Now, you're here though not to hear from me. Uh, you're here because today in our series, we're going to continue what we've done, which is have an opportunity to have a conversation with a leader and an unscripted conversation with a leader one that will reveal things that you might not have known and may even reveal some things that the leader, him or herself, might not have known. As you know, today's leader, you can see him on screen, uh, Dr. Jerome Adams. Many of you are saying, wait, I've seen this guy. And you have seen this guy. Uh, Dr. Adams is uh, the 20th Surgeon General of the United States. And uh, you've certainly seen him many times standing in uniform uh, and talking about um, so many of the challenges that we've had over the last year. Today, we'll talk a little bit about that for sure, but we'll also learn some things about Dr. Adams, about his life. I might end up sharing a few things too. And what we'll also do is we'll talk certainly about what's gone on with a project he and I collaborated on, community health and economic prosperity. And we'll say more about that in a minute. First, I again wanna say a welcome. Just to let you all know, we have participants that are with us today from 131 cities. And we have an international audience as well. So for those of you that are from Argentina, those of you that are from Russia, those of you that are from Great Britain, those of you that are from Brazil, we're sending a wave and a thanks that you are here. And uh, we're looking forward to your questions. Now, you will note as you've logged in, there's a chat function which allows you to provide questions that will filter back to us when we get to the open Q&A section. And we're interested in hearing what's, what your thoughts might be. So um, I'm just gonna start Dr. Adams with, um, we're gonna weave some things in about your background as I go along. But what I'd love to do is just start with, I got up this morning and yes, I was listening to the radio as I was driving in. And I understand that the J&J &J vaccine uh, has been paused. Uh, and you know, I have a friend, one who works with my wife who just got the J&J &J vaccine. Um, I walked in the building today here at Darden with someone who just got the J&J &J vaccine. Would you say a little bit about um, your understanding of where we are today? And maybe even we can begin to talk about the narrative over the last year and change uh, from your perspective. Well, thank you so much, Greg, and uh, welcome to everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be here. Uh, you're correct. Uh, while you and I are very excited about um, many different facets of this conversation, I know the topic on uh, a lot of people's minds right now is COVID and particularly the big news in the US about the J&J &J vaccine. Really taking a quick step back, I want people to know that I am very encouraged about where we are. In the United States, we now have 46% of adults have received at least one dose of vaccination. That is tremendous when you uh, look at the fact that these vaccines are all 90 plus percent effective at uh, stopping serious disease and death, and they're increasingly being shown to be effective at preventing spread of disease. So the way we get back to normal, plain and simple, and uh, it will be a new normal, but the way we get back to some sense of normalcy is uh, by getting as many people as possible vaccinated, and we are well on our way there. There's talk about variants. I want people to understand that uh, the vaccines thus far have been shown to be still highly effective against variants. And what do I mean by highly effective? We, we've been spoiled by the fact that these vaccines are 90 plus percent effective. That's way more than what uh, we thought we would ever achieve in terms of efficacy. 
But uh, even against variants, these vaccines are still greater than 50 to 60 percent effective. And uh, I want to remind people that the flu vaccine in any given year is somewhere between 40 to 60 percent effective. So I don't want people to be overly worried that these vaccines are not going to be as effective against variants right now. What I want people to be worried about is getting as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible so that we don't get a variant that, uh, that escapes the vaccines. Also know that even if we do, uh, we now have the technology in place that we can quickly ramp up a new vaccine. Um, so that's not even uh, you know, a, a situation that is catastrophic, but it is a situation that we can't avoid and that we want to avoid, so get your vaccine. Now, big news today is that the J&J &J vaccine has been paused by the United States. Important for people to understand that that pause is so that the FDA has the ability to look at uh, some potential complications that we're seeing. Uh, there were six women who, uh, out of uh, almost 7 million vaccinations, uh, who had uh, a blood clot, uh, potentially dangerous blood clot. And so as medical professionals, uh, we take an oath to first do no harm. And so uh, in, in, in that vein, there was a pause, and I think an appropriate one, to take a look at the data. Now, it may be that you find that that was just by chance. When you're talking about six people uh, in seven million, there is a reasonable uh, chance that that could happen without indicating any problems with the vaccine, number one. Number two, you look at birth control pills which cause a much higher rate of blood clots. Smoking, which cause a much higher rate of blood clots. Asymptomatic COVID infection, which causes a much higher rate of blood clots than six people in 7 million. And it could be that the people who had these clots had something else going on that either was independent of the vaccine or that uh, worked in concert with the vaccine to cause these clots. So the FDA is gonna investigate that. Um, final important point is that the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna are made completely uh, uh, from a different formulation than the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. They've been given to exponentially more people. We haven't seen these same problems uh, arise with blood clots. And so I want people to still know the uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are still considered to be highly safe and highly effective. And it may be that we very quickly determine the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to, to be safe, or it may be that we say in certain populations, you should avoid the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but that means the process is working. Uh, when you're talking about something that's an incidence of one in one million or less, there's no way you can do trials long enough to, to see that in the initial stages. For every drug, uh, we, there, there's likely to be some complications that we don't see for, for months, years, sometimes decades into the future. And it's why the FDA has a process to continue to follow people and to look for complications. And so people should be reassured that what happened today is a sign that the process is actually functioning in the way it is supposed to, to protect people. Uh, and again, be encouraged by where we are. Um, uh, please, please, if you're offered a vaccine, get it because the risk of getting a blood clot and or dying from COVID is still far greater than even the worst case scenario of the risk from a vaccine. So starting us off with really the basis of what are the levels of risk? I mean, coming from a business school audience, we deal with risk as a regular part of what we do. And thinking about one in a million is first important. And then secondly, this idea that you're pointing out that many of us who aren't healthcare professionals won't recognize just how momentous it is that we have three, not one, not two, but three vaccines created in this really short window of time with an incredible level of um, ability to be protective and prophylactic. So I think that knowledge alone, and this is one of the great benefits, is so important. The other thing I just want to remind any of you who've been with us before, you know, we had on Dr. Vivian Penn, who um, is one of the legends in creating healthcare research that would look at, for example, differential impacts on different genders. So in fact, there was a period where medical research with women was a new idea. And she talked about this in her session. And so you bringing forward this idea that of that one in a million, we might find that certain population, subpopulations uh, might 
have certain reasons to be more concerned. That's consistent with this larger story. So- Well, um, exactly, exactly. And, and I'm so glad you brought up the topic of risk, Greg, because that's a place where the business community really, I think, can help the broader public. Uh, we as humans and we as Americans are notoriously bad at, at uh, calculating risk and incorporating it into our lives. There are any number of things that we do on a daily basis that are much higher risk than things that we will say, I'd never do that um, out of fear. And again, uh, vaccinations is, is one of those wonderful examples. Uh, every single day, one to two people go to the hospital from taking too much Tylenol. But you don't see people out there saying, I'd never take Tylenol. Uh, but you have plenty of people who say, I will never take a vaccine because of one in one million risk or because you think something could go wrong without uh, really understanding the broader impact. And the impact is not just on the individual and not just about your health. Uh, when we look at the damage that's been done to our economy, when we look at the damage that's been done to our mental health, when we look at the damage that's been done to our, a generation of young people, I have three kids, 16, 15, and 11, and they've been out of regular school since last March. We know when we look at war-torn countries and nations and other places that have been disrupted by, by natural disasters and other such phenomenon, sure. that uh, uh, these children who experience a loss of school of this magnitude will see a lifetime of decreased wages, decreased education, increased problems. So uh, there's even a greater benefit to getting vaccinated than the individual uh, physical and medical benefits that it brings because it gives us the confidence to reopen schools, workplaces and beyond. And so that's one of the reasons that I was excited to, to work with you, Greg, and you talked about the project that we worked on I'm really trying to help make the business case for some of the uh, public health and medical interventions that we, uh, that we know to be effective, but that we have a hard time getting people and policymakers to embrace because again, they don't see the ROI for investing in complete streets or the yeah. ROI for, for healthy fruits and vegetables made available to people or the ROI of increasing vaccinations. Well, you're singing music to my ears. And, and for those of us that are with us, um, you know, Dr. Adams and I met when um, actually a mutual friend mentioned uh, the work that I've been doing for years around underserved communities and making the business case for those underserved communities. I hadn't worked in public health. And so for me, there was an incredible amount of learning with the team that pulled together. And for those of you that don't know, there's a Surgeon General's report, the Community Health and Economic Prosperity Report, which we're gonna ask Dr. Adams in a second where he even came up with this idea. But I was invited to participate and spent two years helping to craft uh, what became really a unique piece of work. But the thing that I wanna point out here is not only is there this notion of explaining to business leaders why these matters have ROI impact, by the way, I think the pandemic has underscored how important that is. Indeed. But we also recognize that the world of public health and the world of business don't talk to each other. And if we recognize that businesses operate in intact societies, then that disconnect is in fact costing all of us a great deal of uh, time, money, health, and uh, even our emotional and mental health and so my big learning in the process was not only a whole set of jargon, understanding of things around uh, public health, but my big understanding was we need to bring both of these communities to the table because we're all in the same community. And finally, we learned that there were some stereotypes that um, each group had about the other. So there were some people that characterized, I did a session during our process with some public health folks who had a hard time believing that business leaders could ever really care about um, 
underserved populations. There was a disconnect that that could be true because of course, business people are only interested in huge amounts of profits. And then on the other hand, uh, there were stereotypes some business folks had about people in public health, that these are people that are asking for handouts and asking for our dollars in ways that wouldn't be smart spending. And so that process started and that process must continue. So, so you know, Dr. Adams, where in the world, we, we can think of the type of studies that have been done with certain journals in the past, smoking cessation. Um, we can think of things like opioid use. You come in and you decide community health and economic prosperity, why? Well, great question. And uh, first of all, Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. I've continually seen public health pitted against business. And when that happens, public health more often than not loses, whether you're talking about the climate or whether you're talking about uh, firearm safety or whether you're talking about drug policy, we need to figure out how we can talk the same language. And I'm so glad you framed it the way you did, Greg, because not only do we not talk to each other, but in many ways we can't talk to each other because we're speaking different languages. And I'll give you a really quick example to drive it home for folks. Uh, a diabetes intervention uh, would be something that a public health uh, person or a physician would, would would really look at in terms of the metric of hemoglobin A1C. Uh, what does this do to lower uh, a person or a community's hemoglobin A1C? And if it lowers it by 15%, fantastic. That's a wonderful intervention. But I was at the US Conference of Mayors and uh, we were talking about walkable communities and I asked these mayors, how many of you all ran for office on a pledge to lower your community's hemoglobin A1C rates by 15%? Lo and behold, not a single mayor raised their hand. Uh, I asked them, well, why did you create walkable communities which lower obesity, lower diabetes rates, and decrease your hemoglobin A1C? And they said, we did it because it increases foot traffic downtown. It makes our communities a more desirable place for people to live in and to spend their money. It increases property tax values in the local area and real estate values in the local area. And so at the end of the day, we both cared about an intervention, but we would never ordinarily sit down at a table and talk about it because we, we come at it from completely different places. And so uh, I love the report because you have uh, Greg Fairchild from the UVA Darden School of Business working alongside some of the top public health people, the CDC, the Surgeon General of the United States, trying to create this Rosetta Stone, if you will, that will allow us to talk to one another. And we talk about it in terms of a few key things, if you'll give me just a, a minute. We, sure. we talk about the US health disadvantage. The fact that people in the United States live sicker and die younger than people in comparable wealthy countries, uh, despite spending far more on healthcare than those countries. We spend about $10,000 per person on healthcare whereas most other wealthy countries spend about $4,000 per person on healthcare, and they get much better results. Now, that U.S. health disadvantage costs businesses. It costs them in terms of productivity, in terms of absenteeism, in terms of increased healthcare costs, uh, in, in terms of their ability to be able to recruit a healthy uh, and competitive workforce. And, and so uh, we really dig deeper and look at the fact that you can't solve this problem solely by buying your way out of it uh, at the downstream health care end of the spectrum or by benefit management or by a lot of the things that businesses have really tried to, to rely on uh, without recognizing that 80% of your health is determined by things that happen outside the doctor's office, outside the clinic. It's determined by things like social and economic factors public policies and spending, uh, social and physical environments, including places that are free of violence and racial bias and segregation. And uh, it, it relies on individual behaviors that we know are influenced by the cues and the opportunities that exist around you. So we really, in this report, 
try to make the case to businesses that there are many opportunities, that there's a reason, and then there are many opportunities for businesses to play a meaningful role in the lives of their employees, their consumers, and their communities. And it's ultimately going to feed back to their bottom line. And so, uh, Greg, you and UVA Darden really helped us um, go out and look at some of these businesses. And I'd love to throw it to you for a second, because I know you came to my hometown of Indiana and visited a company right here in Indiana. And I'd love if you could just give the, the folks just a, a little taste of what you experienced in terms of the why and the how a, a major anchor institution here in Indiana um, was embracing this concept. So I'm happy to do that. I, I do want to make a, a personal uh, thought that I want to add in here. So the first is, you know, my own mother, by the way, um, has um, hypertension and prediabetes. And part of one of your points, one of our points in the report is that the services are not distributed equally. So my mother lives in uh, Southwest Virginia, which is more rural. In fact, I know We'll get to this. You lived for a time on a farm. My parents live on a farm. And in fact- You didn't tell them the whole story, Greg. I lived on a tobacco farm. Believe it or not, believe so, it or not, as Surgeon General of the United States. So uh, we didn't grow tobacco, but we did have a lot of the other things. But yes, the idea that Surgeon General of the United States was on a tobacco farm tells a story about progression. And Here's the deal. My family in the part of Virginia where my mother lives, there isn't a diabetes clinic. And so when I came here to the University of Virginia, I was able to help facilitate my mother into a diabetes clinic here at a Research One University, and it's meant all the difference. And so that early involvement saves lives. I can personally attest to it. And I can also attest to that these things are not evenly distributed. Now about um, Batesville, Indiana. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, Batesville, Indiana is the home of a company called Hill & Brand. Some of you may also know it. It has big trucks that travel the country. It is a market leading company and it's called not just Hill and Brand, the Batesville Casket Company. And it is a company that controls more than 50% of the market in what we call the funeral business. Now, um, myself and one of our case writers, who Dr. Adams got to meet, Jerry Yemen, she and I traveled to Batesville, Indiana to get to tell the story of this market leading firm. And again, I just want to underscore, it's like Dr. Adams' notion of tobacco farmer to surgeon general. We were visiting with a company whose business it is to assist people after someone has passed away. Nevertheless, the company is very consistently concerned with the health of the community in which it operates. And Batesville has really two main employers, and Hill and Brand is one of those. But what we were able to discern both about the company's strategy in the marketplace, but the company's strategy in understanding the workforce and the community in which they were embedded, there are any number of investments, investments in education, investments in um, smoking cessation programs, investments in many of the types of things that lead to lower cost down the road and that's why we're calling them investments in ROI. And so what Dr. Adams knows is a story he knew from uh, being in Indiana and a story he knew from his years uh, leading health for the state of Indiana. But this leading firm, Joe Raver runs this firm as the CEO, needs no encouragement or explanation as to why making the investments in their town leads and contributes to them being the North American leader, if not the global leader in their industry. So I encourage all of you to take a look at the report mm -hmm. and you'll come across companies like this. Now, uh, Dr. Adams, I wanna ask a little bit. So, you know, let's imagine you're there and uh, you're talking to your parents and you say, hey, years from now, I think I wanna be the Surgeon General of the United States. So 
uh, maybe this is true. Maybe this isn't true. When did the idea of being the Surgeon General, different than being in medicine, come to you? Uh, honest truth, it didn't come to me until the day that uh, um, Donald Trump was elected President of the United States. And, uh, and I say that to you very honestly. I grew up, again, in a rural area. I grew up uh, in, in poverty. Both my parents were school teachers, but school teachers don't now and then then make um, uh, really a, a living wage for a family of five. And, uh, and even though I did well in school, I never imagined that I could be a doctor. Uh, I also grew up in an area where there were no doctors um, from my background. The first doctor I met ever in my life who was African-American wasn't until I went to college and had the opportunity to meet Dr. Ben Carson in Baltimore. And so there's a saying, uh, you have to see it to be it. Uh, right. I didn't see it. So it wasn't even on my radar screen. Uh, I, I uh, did well in school again, both parents school teachers and uh, really enjoyed math and science, but went to school to be an engineer. And I was part of a Meyerhoff scholarship program that you and I talked about before we got uh, on this, uh, this webinar, but it's a program that's really focused on increasing the number of minorities who pursue advanced degrees in math and science. And I want uh, people out there to understand that there are fewer black males graduating from medical school today in 2021 than there were 40 years ago. So not only have we not improved, we're going backwards in terms of diversity in, in many of these uh, STEM fields particularly in the medical fields. And so uh, uh, I met Dr. Carson. I won't go through the whole story, but uh, switched my path, went into medicine and got the advocacy bug. And I got the advocacy bug because as much as I love taking care of patients, I began to notice over and over and over again. And I, I actually talk about this in a TED talk that I give that no matter how many people I helped, there were more people in line waiting to be helped and there were people who I had been able to help. It was just a revolving door. I saw the same people over and over again. And uh, I wanted to figure out how I could change the system. So I got involved in organized medicine, the American Medical Association, uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists. I started going to DC, going to my state house, trying to figure out how can we change systems so that we can uh, turn off the spigot instead of mopping up the water when it spilled over the sink. And did that for, uh, about a decade in addition to teaching myself. I became a teacher like my parents did. I taught at the uh, medical school for a decade. And uh, then Governor Mike Pence needed someone to run his Indiana State Department of Health right as Ebola was heating up in the United States. Another interesting story because we talk about COVID as if we've, as if we've never been there before. Um, we've had threats like this before uh, and uh, we just need to learn from them and prevent fires in the future as opposed to simply putting fires out. But ran the State Department of Health uh, for three years, dealt with Ebola, Zika, dealt with the largest HIV outbreak related to injection drug use in the history of the United States that occurred uh, around Southern Indiana, where Batesville Casket Company is, where businesses were fi finding that they had real trouble actually recruiting healthy um, uh, workers because so many of them failed the drug test. And uh, uh, had a successful tenure there. We actually legalized syringe service programs in the state of Indiana, and that turned into syringe service programs being legalized all over the Midwest, changed federal law, or federal, uh, federal rule, uh, regulations on syringe service programs. And so uh, many people aren't familiar with that story, but I'm very proud of the work that uh, we were able to do in partnership with businesses, with churches, with a law enforcement with the local community to change the culture so that we could change outcomes for people. And then uh, again, to, to, to put a, a, an ending on a much longer story, Governor Mike Pence became Vice President Mike Pence and uh, my name got thrown into the hat for Surgeon General. And I got a call from, uh, from then Vice President Mike Pence asking me uh, if I would come to uh, Trump Tower and have a conversation about potential opportunities with the uh, new administration. 
And uh, I know we want to go on to other things, but I just really want to drive home one point to folks because uh, I tell that story and I know that some of the people listening immediately say, how could you work for that administration? I could never do that. I'd never want to do that. And I just want to remind everyone because I had friends, family members say to me, don't do it. Um, you, 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 it's going to ruin your career. Um, I don't like that administration. I don't like that person. Um, uh, please don't do it. There are tens of thousands of public servants across the United States working in government, keeping your roads paved, keeping your hospitals open, uh, keeping your, your fires or, or providing uh, opportunities for your fire to be put out if your house is on fire. And uh, we need those people in there, even if, and sometimes especially if you don't like the leadership in charge, we need good people in those public service roles. And so I would just encourage you to think about that and to support public servants at a time when they're under unprecedented attack. Uh, because if we don't have good people in those roles, then we're all going to suffer and we can't afford to take four years off because we don't like the governor or the president. So that's a long story of how I became Surgeon General. Um, and I'm actually uh, in the process of thinking about a book right now so people can read more about that hopefully in the future if, uh, if I do get to write that book. But uh, it'll be a lot about a lot of what we've talked about, uh, about making those connections, those partnerships and encouraging people to get involved. You know, I am, so I have a personal angle on this same story. You know, um, I've been involved for years in studying community development finance. And um, I got the call in 2017 to be invited to join the U.S. Treasury's Community Advisory Board. Now, this board is the board that advises the Treasury specifically on the spending that goes into underserved communities. This is the area I'd built my career on. But I'm pointing out to the listeners that call came in 2017. And when the call came, I had friends and family who said, uh, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to take the call? Now, the person who was making the call was someone actually who had been appointed by Obama and had worked with me for years. Um, she ran the CDFI fund of the U.S. Treasury. But we both knew that the call was coming and that I had to consider what this might mean. For me, when I ratcheted back, sounds like you had a family that had been involved in public service. You know, my father had served and took a commission in the U.S. military just as the U.S. military was integrating um, all of its units. And my dad served his entire career um, under numbers of chief executives, presidents, who from a policy standpoint, um, he had difference and a disagreement, but he always understood that and told me in the house that even though I have this feeling about this particular president or administration and what it's putting forth, I believe in the institution as a whole. And I believe that my contribution to the institution will end up being important. And I went back to my dad who's since passed away um, but I thought about him having been in these moments, and that was part of the reason I continued. Now, um, I do want to spend uh, just a couple of minutes in a more personal way. So um, in the uh, fall of 1998, my wife and I found out that we would be having our first child and that our first child would have um, Down syndrome, but would also have a significant heart defect. And, uh, you know, we both MBAs, both with a bunch of degrees, hadn't really thought that these types of societal challenges would ever be faced by us. And um, it was a tough time. It was a time where we were in doctor's offices virtually every week and uh, trying to figure out what to do. My daughter had open heart surgery in her fourth month of life. It was something that we know, she, you talk about percentages, there was a pretty significant percentage, percentage she wouldn't live. Especially she, in 1998. Especially in 1998. She's 21 years now, old now, and that's another story for another time. You've had some challenges in your own life uh, with your family, and I wondered if you would be willing to talk about some of that. 
Well, I'm so pleased that you shared your story. And I want to thank you for that because it's hard. It's hard for us to talk about our own personal experiences, but I think that's an important part of representation um, and, and the importance of being at the table because you're able to share that story on behalf of um, the hundreds of thousands of people uh, and parents out there who are dealing with a Down syndrome diagnosis and you're able to normalize it and, and, and push back against stigma. And that's really what I tried to do as Surgeon General. I talk about my mother who had a stroke last year at the beginning of the pandemic and for whom I've seen uh, her suffer as much from the shutdown and an inability to get therapy for her stroke as, as, uh, as potentially she could have suffered had she gotten COVID. Uh, I talk about my wife who is, has metastatic melanoma, is uh, undergoing cancer treatment right now, diagnosis delayed because of COVID and because of the shutdowns. I talk about my brother who has substance use disorder and was released from uh, incarceration right at the beginning of the pandemic and has really struggled because a lot of the uh, recovery and rehab facilities have been shut down because of the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I really saw my, my role as Surgeon General, not so much as being the nation's doctor, as in being the nation's patient, being that surrogate for people out there who uh, have a loved one with substance use disorder or who have a loved one dealing with a cancer diagnosis. And, uh, and I've been through the struggles that many of you all have faced trying to get treatment, trying to overcome stigma, trying to prevent it from happening to me or to my own kids in the future moving forward. And you may have seen, I uh, Instagrammed my colonoscopy last week uh, because I wanted people to understand my dad had polyps uh, uncovered at an early age. And so it was important for me to get my colonoscopy early. Uh, and I actually had two polyps discovered that had I waited uh, may have turned into cancer in the future. So uh, I really do try to speak personally and from the heart and to be approachable. And uh, it served me well throughout my career and uh, I hope it serves me well in terms of the conversation that we're having with people all across the world today, Greg. Well, I, I want to um, take a few questions from the audience. And I have one. Um, it comes from one of our colleagues here at the Darden School, Vivian Reefberg. Vivian is um, one of our professors of practice here and, a, and an expert in public health and healthcare herself. And so, uh, Vivian, I'm going to not do this the service that you would, but I'm going to do my best. Um, you know, the joke I made earlier when we were getting started was, you know, this camera shot that we had shows how much weight I've gained over the course of COVID. And Vivian's question isn't about Greg's weight gain. Vivian's question is about obesity and the obesity crisis in the United States. Um, how you think, Dr. Adams, about that as a public health area, how can it be addressed through business? Because we can think of some ways it could be addressed through the healthcare system or through policy. And then um, recognizing that Michelle Obama did some work um, on thinking about fresh foods. By the way, just side point, Vivian may have known, a big part of that work went through community development financial institutions that I have been studying and, and feature in my book. Uh, the work on, on creating fresh foods and grocery stores in places that are food deserts. But what's your take on what business can do to help with that problem? Well, I love that question and I'll be succinct so we can hit as many questions as possible. From a scientific point of view, putting on my doctor's hat, obesity is simply a matter of calories in and calories out. So how many calories are you taking in on a daily basis? How many calories are you burning on a daily basis? That said, we know that there are certain foods that are uh, calorie laden, and we know that there are certain neighborhoods where you don't have as many opportunities to burn off those calories. So uh, one of the things we talk about in the report that you and I worked on, Greg, are the vital conditions that exist all around us. And those vital conditions include things like safe streets, include things like not living in a food desert and having access to fresh fruits and vegetables 
And so uh, uh, to, to succinctly uh, tell you what businesses can do, they can understand, first of all, what's going on in their community, learn about your stakeholders, know if you live in the diabetes belt. Unfortunately, now um, diabetes is all over the country. There is no more diabetes belt. We're all dealing with it. Uh, understand uh, if the people who work for you or are part of your uh, stakeholder chain uh, exist in places where they don't where, where they don't have these opportunities to uh, to really think about uh, uh, making smarter choices about uh, calories in or or about going out and exercising. I, I'm a big believer in personal responsibility, but I also am a big believer that the choices people make are 100% dependent on the choices that they have around them. And uh, you're in the studio. I'm sitting in my office right now. And right outside my office uh, in, in my home is a lovely street with a sidewalk and a contained neighborhood. And uh, if my kids were home, I could tell them, go outside and leave me alone and run and play and not be worried if I didn't see them for an hour, two hours. Uh, far too many people across our nation can't do that don't have that opportunity because they're worried they're gonna be hit by a car or shot by a stray bullet That's or accosted by a drug dealer. Um, and uh, they certainly don't have the opportunity that I have financially and because the grocery store is a mile away from me to go and get fish, which I'm gonna have for dinner tonight and green, fresh green beans to, to prepare. And so businesses can learn about their stakeholders. They can partner with people in the community. You don't have to fix all the problems. You've got to recognize them and partner to uh, to do things like like encourage uh, en encourage uh, markets where people can uh, can go out farmers markets uh, encourage complete streets and the, there are examples of these in the report that we put together right. of uh, organizations who are doing this but I I want you to know you can do it and it will matter to your bottom line because uh, diabetes costs employers four thousand dollars more per person per year for an employee who has diabetes than for one who doesn't. What can you do with that $4,000? How much R&D can you do? How many more people can you hire for $4,000 times the number of people with diabetes, with diabetes you have? It matters to you and there are things you can do to move the needle. You know, um, in so many ways, this is again, consistent with the logic we lay out in the report. Um, but in so many ways, the other thing I just wanna point out is some of us who have advantages, you know, the old saying is you were born on third base and you made it to home and you thought you hit a home run. Um, we forget that there are a set of presumptions we have about conditions. And so it's easy to say, if these people would just stop smoking, drinking and eating too much, they would have no problems. And we often, and it's a personal responsibility, personal choice thing, not recognizing the conditions in which people are in have a dramatic influence, big part of uh, both of our work. I want to shift on that note to a question that comes from Jake Berlin. And Jake Berlin is um, one of our students. Um, what he's asking is he's wondering about this question of personal freedom in a slightly <laughs> different way. So I think you may know uh, the political discourse in the country has involved um, where the personal freedom ends and the public health begins. And that could be everything from uh, questions one has about uh, whether we should reopen and how quickly or questions about whether we should mandate certain types of protocols for the population. Now we can think about that directly in terms of COVID, but how do you think about that in general? Could you say a little bit well, about Well, I, I love that question. And again, uh, I think we need to make the practical business case to people. Um, I would love to think that we're all um, uh, ultimately altruistic and willing to give, uh, uh, give up of ourselves for others. But at the end of the day, um, uh, if you look at uh, behavioral science, uh, we, we operate based on Maslow's hierarchy. We operate based on meeting our own basic needs first before we get to some of those more altruistic thoughts and endeavors. And so we need to help people understand how uh, public health matters to them as an individual. The problem is when people think public health, they think it's benefiting other people and I'm the one making the sacrifice. But what COVID has shown us in stark detail but this is the case for the opioid epidemic. 
for diabetes and obesity, for so many other things out there, is that if someone is unhealthy out there, if someone doesn't have the opportunities to make healthy choices, that impacts us all. Uh, give you a real concrete example in the context of COVID. Uh, we can tell someone you've been exposed to COVID and you need to go home and quarantine. But what does that mean if they took public transportation to get here and they've got to hop on the bus or the metro to go back home and expose everyone? What does it mean if they live in multi-generational housing uh, and, uh, and they don't, it was one bathroom and they don't have the ability to, uh, to actually stay away from other people? What does it mean if they, uh, they're the sole breadwinner for their family and they're barely making a living wage and they're not gonna be able to pay their mortgage uh, or their rent if they don't go to work, even if they are sick. If we don't think about those vital conditions, those public conditions, then that person is going to do something, which then is going to cause the spread of COVID, which may ultimately either come back and affect us directly in terms of COVID for one, us or our family members, or more broadly, cause continued spread and variants, which keep school shut down, jobs closed, travel restricted and beyond. And so uh, I really hope we embrace the lessons of COVID and understand that if one person doesn't have the uh, resources and the opportunities to make a healthy choice, it ultimately comes back on and affects all of our, all of us in terms of health and wealth. So, you know, we talk in business schools, um, not just in business schools, about the tragedy of the commons and mm -hmm. this notion that someone has to care about the common wealth. And no, I don't mean the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, so that question is consistent with this very important place where public policy meets uh, public health. And that's part of what uh, Jake Berlin is asking us about. I'm going to go personal. Well, well again, and, and I, before you move on, I just want to really quickly, again, highlight the report, because that's what we did for businesses. Uh, we, we, we can and do say to them, you should do this because it's the right thing to do. But we also say to them, you should do this because it's gonna help you out. It's gonna help your bottom line. And we make that case. And I think we, again, need to do a better job of showing how firearm safety and a clean, uh, clean and safe environment and how uh, complete streets and how a living wage and how all of these policies that we think of as helping other people mm -hmm. and not us, help us. Yeah, this has always been a big part of my work, understanding and helping to show that what appears to be uh, individual benefit or special interest benefit is the code word often used is actually a system benefit. You know, I want to go a little personal, you know, um, I, I, I have one of the genetic uh, consumer products and um, one of the things that the product allows me to do is to determine whether I have any of the markers that would suggest I'll have Alzheimer's. And in fact, you can choose to know this information or not choose to know this information. And we know that some people choose not to have the information. I did find out. But part of the reason I think people may feel that way, and this uh, is inspired by a question from Marco Pazam, um, since Alzheimer's currently doesn't have a um, prescribed way to lead to alleviation of the disease. Um, what's your thoughts about first um, dealing, Marco has someone in his family, what's your thoughts about the way someone who's dealing with a problem that we currently don't have a solution for? And what might you say to Marco or someone who finds out through data that uh, they could have Alzheimer's in the future? Well, this is something that's very personal to me also. Uh, both of my grandmothers died of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, I love them both very much. I watched them both deteriorate. They both had very long courses with it. So uh, 15 to 20 years each that I watched them deteriorate slowly from the disease. And what I would say to Marco, number one, is thank you for, uh, for sharing. And uh, I, I would say from a scientific point of view, there are things that we can do to, uh, to delay the onset and to mitigate the harm of Alzheimer's. There are certain resources, there are certain environments, um, uh, there are certain uh, preparations that we can make that allow people even with developing Alzheimer's to function in a home environment or a community environment for a longer period of time. And that helps that individual it helps their family, 
guess what? It also helps society because it costs a whole lot more to institutionalize uh, someone or put them in a nursing home than what it does to take care of them in a home environment. And I actually had a conversation uh, with the VA recently about this, uh, the broader topic of how do we uh, really dig deep into the concept of, of caring for people in a home environment, because it costs sometimes 10 times as much to take care of someone in a nursing home for the federal government or for a family as it does to keep them in their home environment. And they often do worse in that, that institutional environment versus in the home environment. So we need to, the more we know, the more we can get research funding, the more we can give people tools to, to do what we know works now, and the more we can uh, think about and, uh, and really uncover new things that will help us in the future, recognizing that this should be a priority. You know, um, yesterday uh, here at the Darden School, we had a session with uh, Joanne Jenkins, the CEO of AARP. And funny enough, uh, no surprise, this set of questions about how we prepare the right ground for an aging population is central to her work. And our MBA students engaged with her. We, we, we had a great session with her, really thinking about understanding aging as an opportunity and where the opportunities can actually create new business opportunities. And that's, that's the thing I'm going to say just a couple of things, and then uh, maybe we'll have time for you to have a final word, Dr. Adams. But one of the other parts of our report is not looking at the cost side of the equation around community health, but the opportunity side. And so something we haven't talked about that's in, consistent with this idea that Joanne Jenkins mentioned yesterday is that what we really have as an opportunity to think about ways that improvements can be made, investments can be made. Yes, they can save us money, but we could also think of new products and new markets that actually could be growth businesses that help solve some of the problems we face in community health. And there's people working with it in FinTech ways. There are people working with it in ways that provide nudges behaviorally. There are lots of things and I would encourage people to focus on that. What I wanna give you a, a bit of a final word if I could, Dr. Adams, is um, you know, your personal narrative has been uh, nuanced throughout your business narrative. You've talked about bringing yourself to work. You've talked about carrying along your family, the agricultural experience, your brother, uh, your parents, and those seem infused with what you do. And again, I'm preparing the, the soil. I hope you all appreciate the analogy. But I'm going to let you have the last word because what I first want to do is I, before I give you the last word, I want to thank Everyone who came in today from 131 cities and you know uh, across the globe for being here. We want to continue the discussion. So this is a session. It's one hour long. But I want you all to know that Dr. Adams has also let me announce, agreed to be uh, one of Darden's Dean's DC Fellows. And he's one of a group of people that we're going to continue to do work with. So if you have questions for Dr. Adams, if there are projects you'd like to do, if you're a business person and have a point of view on how to get involved in this work, we're, he's going to continue doing what he's doing, but he's going to do some of that with us here at Darden. And we are happy to be connected to you. We're happy to tell your story, sort of like the story we told of the Batesville Casket Company or Hillenbrand. So Dr. Adams, giving you the last word, um, recognizing your life story, what's next for the 20th Surgeon General of the United States? Well, um, I love how you framed it in terms of opportunities. And I think about our aging population and so many people look at that as a problem or a deficit. And uh, I look at it as a tremendous opportunity. Uh, right now we have youth across the country who are looking for mentors, who are looking for coaches for youth sports. Uh, there are so many companies out there that are looking for uh, people uh, to be part of their workforce. How do we prepare and retrain uh, folks post-retirement to then stay engaged in society? That helps us. That helps them. 
because we know that's a way to delay the onset of dementia and Alzheimer's is keeping people engaged. One of the things we talk about in the report are opportunity use. And some people call them disconnected use. Uh, young people between the ages of 18 and uh, 24 years old who don't have a job, who aren't in school, and who many cases, uh, in many cases, are getting in trouble. Um, they are disconnected, but companies like Hyatt, um, companies like Bank of America, have really sought to bring those individuals back into the fold and find that when they provide a supportive environment, they can become some of the uh, most loyal employees that they have because someone saw the opportunity and didn't just see them as a problem. And so uh, what I would encourage you to do is what I'm going to uh, do. I always try to have a positive attitude. I try um, because every challenge brings with it an opportunity. Uh, there's certainly sorrow um, uh, to all around with 560,000 people who have died. But I don't want us to miss the opportunity to correct some of the flaws in our system that have been exposed because of COVID. Some of the opportunities to improve things going forward in our work-life balance. That's something we've explored. Telework, um, what, what are we gonna do in that space? Addressing disparities, data collection, the rapid pace of development of the vaccine. Will that allow us to come up with more rapid um, uh, discovery of drugs for Alzheimer's or for, uh, other, uh, for cancer or, or other such uh, issues that, that have plagued us for quite a while. Look for the opportunities and look for the partnerships because none of us gets through this world alone. But if we try to find the, uh, the commonalities, the opportunities and forge those partnerships, uh, I, I think we'll be better for it. And uh, that's in a broad sense what I'm trying to do. Uh, in a very uh, specific sense, I'm excited to work with UVA Darden uh, and to uh, find some partners within that network that we can uh, create other roads out of stones with, that we can, uh, you know, figure out how to better speak each other's languages because we've fallen into tribes nowadays and we stopped speaking common languages and uh, it's killing us. It's killing our nation more than COVID is killing our nation. And so I, I ask that all of you join with me um, in this country and beyond to see beyond the tribes that we've fallen into, to really uh, remember that there's more that we share in common than there ever could be that separates us scientifically, culturally, politically. And if you look for the opportunities and look for the partnerships, then what you'll see, what you'll find is a better world for all of us. Well. Um, that's a great last word. And on behalf of uh, Dean Scott Beardsley, on behalf of the Darden School, on behalf of the DC Initiatives team of Leanne Berlin and Laura, Laura Hennessy, I really want to thank all of you for being here. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.